If you've seen the other parts, you get bragging rights in the comments. But if you haven't, go watch them right now. In the blue corner, you have Screw Attack working on the arduous production that is Death Battle Season 2. But they would later encounter their most valuable asset, who just so happened to be in the red corner, Rooster Teeth. As they would merge into what would become one of the best partnerships a YouTube web series would have, they needed Death Battle to make some changes, forcing Charizard vs. Agumon to be the supposed Season 2 finale. And while the audience was just as happy with the episode as the creators themselves were, all that was left was to see where the future would go. And... let's talk about this season. Baba ba Season 3, have you any wool? Only 14 episodes full? As opposed to the 16 episodes worth that most future seasons would have? Well, that does explain a lot. In what is the shortest season of Death Battle, this was also the first time that they were working under an annual schedule with a much bigger team. Some faces are still on the team today, such as Sam Mitchell and Louise Cruz. And much like how Season 1 was a rough production given the limited resources as well as Baby's first internet show, Season 3 is what I like to call Baby's first professional career if that makes any sense. The latter half of Season 2 would dip its toes into the water of a three-week waiting period, as opposed to a waiting period of however long they needed. And this wasn't without its benefits. Although there were moments where a couple of episodes got delayed, aside from that, scheduling issues were reduced to a minimum. Yet despite this, you'd be surprised as to how infamous this season is, often considered to be the worst season of Death Battle. Yeah, some people have started giving shoutouts to its more underrated episodes, but they still won't let up on its low points, which are very similar to the low points of Season 2 and with virtually none of its high points. That being said, when you take a look at the season premiere, that is impossible to believe. This was such a perfect premiere for this season, and a part of that is based around coincidence. This was around the time where Bayonetta was revealed as the final DLC character of Super Smash Bros. 4. And I'm sure that Dante has been a heavily requested character to show up on the show. And while r slash death battle matchups insists on Dante being an opponent for every character in fiction, this is the only matchup he needs. Don't. At. Me. I could rant about that for hours, but we need to talk about the episode itself. I love the beginning of Dante's analysis. The beginning of Devil's Never Cry being used as the introduction to Dante's character gives a sense of grandeur to Dante as a whole. This makes for what would become a very engaging analysis. And they also have the jukebox clip, which would normally feel like it's running for too long, but it actually flows with the analysis very well. With the way that the music from the analysis continues into the clip before stopping when Dante tries turning on the jukebox, making for a subtle editing gag. Dante's analysis is filled with some other jokes as well, like with Boomstick saying, HIT IT WHEN THAT HAPPENS, in response to Dante turning into an orphan, utilized in a way that's even funnier than in Green Arrow vs. Hawkeye. I guess if I had to come up with one complaint, it'd be that it kind of ends abruptly with Boomstick making an unrelated joke and then it cuts to Dante's end clip, but the end clip is badass enough to overshadow it. And then we get to Bayonetta's analysis. And given the type of character she is, I'm sure we could expect plenty of horny Boomstick. No. Surprisingly, there is no horny boomstick. I mean, that's not actually true, but this analysis alone somehow has less sex jokes than the entirety of Tiger Zord vs. Epion. And the sex jokes they do use are actually kinda funny, like Boomstick laughing about the word climax. There's also the monkey witch joke, and um... Okay, that's a little weird. Is her analysis as engaging as Dante's? No, but it's still really good, and definitely sells me on the world of Bayonetta. But I really want to talk about this fight, and it's probably the fight animation I rewatched the most. Aside from one example, but we got six more seasons before talking about that one. It starts off with a very natural setup. Dante is looking for the left eye because it's a demon artifact, and I haven't played Devil May Cry or Bayonetta, but I think this is something that he would be searching for in his games, likely for safety or something. And Bayonetta attacks him for it because she knows what it is and doesn't want it getting into the wrong hands. And then the vibe of these first two acts is just the two having a blast but still trying to take each other down. I mean, this technically has more sex jokes than even Bayonetta's analysis, but it feels very fitting giving the two 
two characters, and it's more than made up for with the amazing voice performances. Steven Fu's Dante and Marissa Lenti's Bayonetta are two of my favorite performances of the series. In fact, I actually like them more than Chuck Huber's Tony and Gianni's Lex. They're just that good. And when they start fighting, okay, Dante's stiff movement is kind of difficult to ignore, and some of Dante's sword slashes are also kind of stiff, but to be fair, he's mostly just trying to block Bayo's arrows and attacks. This makes sense with the analysis, as they describe Dante as someone who's cocky and doesn't put too much effort into most of his fights. And that's sold even more with Dante casually spitting out some bullets, letting himself get eaten by Gomorrah, and not using a lot of his weapons at the start, only using Rebellion, Ebony and Ivory, his Quicksilver style, a little bit of Gilgamesh, and <laughs> some chairs. Meanwhile, you have Bayonetta using Love It's Blue, Madama Butterfly, Kafka, Rakshasa, Witch Time, Gamora, Arluna, and Take Mikazuchi. Definitely more than what Dante's willing to put in. I'm also kind of a sucker for the visual of the white Quicksilver mixed with the purple border from Witch Time, leading to a surprisingly nice looking aesthetic. Just another means of helping this episode stand up and shout. Dante does start to have a little more fun fighting once they crash through the building, and yes, yes, Find You from Anarchy Reign starts playing, that is BASE! And then you have Trish and John showing up out of nowhere. Or is it? This was actually foreshadowed in the analysis. Although this doesn't stop some of his allies from joining in from time to time. Okay, that's amazing. And this is where the hair physics are at the worst. John's hair has a mind of its own at points and isn't sculpted particularly well, and Bayonetta's frills are also too free-floating. Doesn't hurt the animation as it's still really good. It's just that when looking at screenshots, it looks a little off. But then again, you get to see some team combos from Dante and Trish, as well as some strategies from Bayonetta and Jean. I love that! And this is also where Dante gets to use some of his extra weapons, starting to take the fight more seriously at least a little bit. And Trish does use some of her voice clips from MVC3 at random, but given that Trish doesn't have that many lines and Morgan Barry has a fairly similar delivery in her lines, it's not nearly as jarring as it is in Wolverine vs Raiden. And after all that, the rocket from Dante's Pandora blows up the building and then they fight on the remains referencing the Umbra Clock Tower level from Bayonetta 2. Jean knocks Trish off the platform and Dante starts to get worried, and that finally gets him to take the fight seriously. Oh, and this Devil Trigger scene? <laughs> Okay, this is one of my all-time favorite parts of the series. No, not the season, the series. The music, the attack grunts from Steven, combined with the reverb effect, the black glow around Dante, the speed at which he's blocking Madama Butterfly's attacks. And sure, some people take issue with a don't f with the witch line, but it doesn't bother me. Plus, it gets saved by this shot of Dante blocking its attack, not only referencing a feat from the analysis, but also just being a really cool shot itself. And their final clash forces Dante to lose Devil Trigger, honestly, it still makes me forget that Dante can survive being impaled like that, and how Dante looks like when he gets stabbed, even making some noises as if he's losing his breath. And then the battle cools down with Dante using Lucifer to stab Bayonetta multiple times, throwing a rose, and causing an explosion as the debris from the building falls to the ground. And then Dante just walks off with Shuraba stuck in his chest. Yeah, that's definitely a Dante moment. And then the outro clip has Bayonetta's untextured corpse dragged into Inferno. And then we get to the conclusion and... Okay, admittedly there's a lot to address here. There were rumors that the team planned Bayonetta to win this episode, but switched it back out of nowhere despite the researchers wanting her to win. Nice argument, Death Battle hater. Why don't you back that up with a source? My source is that I made it the f up! Yeah, that checks out. Though if we were to get into versus debating, I am convinced that Bayonetta wins, but I don't care about that and I fail to see why I should. And let me explain what I mean by that. Previously, I've criticized Death Battle episode's conclusion for supposedly being wrong, but I only do that when it's wrong by its own logic. Whether they bring up a feat in the conclusion that doesn't seem as strong or reliable as what the loser has, or if they just decided not to mention something they brought up in the analysis. That's when I think it's fair to criticize a Death Battle episode's verdict, not over some outside factors that they don't bring up. I know that people would find this stupid anyway, and to each their own, but if I really cared about who actually wins, I have other sources to go to. Most notably the G1 blog, which side note, this episode was the first time they would do prediction blogs for death battle episodes. And they're still going strong today, even doing some matchup that death battle isn't doing. Oh by the way, post a thin frost a thin here for the first time since late 2021, hooray. But I was completely out of the loop with the G1 blogs during the time of this recording, and I just read both parts of the blog the other day, and they had the matchup at a tie. I mean, it doesn't change my opinion on who wins, but now you have a good argument to prove that Dante does win, even if it mostly involves that goddamn b 
Fuck! And this does go into the criticism of Death Battle using the wrong kind of research or not using sufficient enough research to prove who would win. And I do think that's a valid point to make, but I think it's better to address that criticism in later seasons, as it's far more relevant there than it is with an episode like Dante vs. Bayonetta. But until then, going by the logic they use in this episode, their argument does hold up. They say that while Bayonetta is physically stronger, Dante's healing factor and durability are just too much for what Bayonetta is able to dish out. Not to mention they say Dante is a lot faster and can make her witch time completely useless. And whether or not you agree with the outcome itself, the argument they're using does hold up. But even though I personally disagree with the outcome, this was a fantastic episode. Unironically, one of my all-time favorites. 99 out of 100. Whoa! <laughs> Okay, for the worst season, that's a higher score than what I gave anything in season two. Oh, and now Death Battle is just casually dropping one of my all-time most wanted matchups. For the worst season, this is pretty exciting. And going into the analyses, they finally learned to talk about Peach without making a sex joke. What a novel concept. Bowser's analysis has some other fun moments like the alliteration bit, though I do wish it showed up more often, but what they do is pretty humorous. You think he can grow his- No, I don't want to think about it. <laughs> I'd be lying if I said it didn't make me chuckle with how Wiz is paranoid by the very thought of it. I don't want to get demonetized. They do call Bowser an idiot, but I mean, they're not wrong. Bowser is indeed a tryhard, and he's not the sharpest tool in the shed. Or should I say not the sharpest head on the turtle pe- Ganondorf's analysis is somehow less grand than Bowser's despite being a more serious villain, but it's got some good moments here and there. The Star Wars prequel joke was okay. I smirked at Boomstick roasting Wiz for his last date. And the Gerudo Desert theme plays when they talk about the Triforce of power and okay this is really unfitting aside from that his analysis was fine but i'm sure a lot of people would want me to talk about the fight don't they mm. the fight starts with a custom sprite of a koopa and a goomba that went uncredited oops and a weird camera jitter during the shy guy's walk cycle oh, oh okay that's not good I do like the setup, though. Bowser's minions find the Triforce of Power and it gets Bowser excited, only for Ganon to come in and challenge him. Yeah, yeah, that's a pretty fitting setup for these two characters. But unfortunately, there's not a lot to like about this episode. This chandelier bit is a hot mess. Look, I understood that reference. It's a very base reference from a very base game called Super Mario RPG, but it doesn't convey that the chandelier is hanging above a bottomless pit. And it's even said to crash to the floor, but the sound effect is loud enough to where it comes across as if it was roughly around around the same height as Bowser's chandelier, so it seemed as if it fell very, very slowly. I mean, I guess I could see Bowser celebrating afterwards, but not to a point of stopping the music to play his Smash 4 victory theme, nor to this flash of a weird hand-drawn shot of Ganon and then a slow fly behind him with a JoJo reference. Why is this so long? I guess I like Bowser's drop kick until it cuts to a second long shot of a door, which also cuts off the music for some fucking reason. People do like the tennis match. I kinda do. It does have pretty slow pacing, but at the end of the day, it's a cute reference and they mix up the shots with Ganon shooting multiple shots at once, Bowser knocking them back by spinning his shell, and Ganon manipulating them before they reach his side of the court. Not as fun as I remember, but still pretty neat. I mean, I guess I should give it more praise because right after that, we're back to poor pacing with Ganon slowly knocking him in the lava twice, twice for some reason. And then Bowser slowly popping out of his clown car. Bowser slowly growing in size. Oh, to be fair, that has more justification for it. And oh, that is a really cool shot. Yeah, back to back. Ooh, mm, mm, that's so good. But why is Ganon's pig form so small? It's shorter than his base form. <laughs> what? And then the death. Ganon gets bored, but wins via his curse ability which is never brought up at any part of the episode outside at one point in the conclusion. At least the outro clip with Ganon using Bowser's bones as a puppet combined with Boomstick's babe reference is pretty funny. And of course, Blood on Broken Glass and Olympus Mons are good tracks, but I don't quite understand the meaning behind their names. I guess Blood on Broken Glass has something to do with, like, they break into castles or something, but that's kind of vague and not really necessary, aside from them both being, uh, princess kidnappers. Sure. And Olympus Mons, while I do think it's the better track, its name makes even less sense. Like, Olympus Mons is a volcano on Mars. What thematic purpose does a name like this serve? 
I mean, I guess this was back when Brandon Yates first tried coming up with track names for episodes, but this one always struck me as odd. But I know what you're all here for. The No Limits Fallacy. <clears throat> I mean, the conclusion. In the analysis, they say that Bowser has survived black holes and a dip in the sun, yet they don't give anything to Ganon that can match that in terms of strength or durability. To be fair, they acknowledge this, and their argument is that Ganon's cursed magic could bypass his durability. But not only is it never brought up outside of the conclusion, but their source for proving that it can kill Bowser effectively is that it can decay a tree. I try and debunk this, but that would technically be using outside factors, so I won't. But I do have a couple of concerns. So for one, they say that Ganondorf would have to rely on tactics, but throughout most of the fight, he's using brute force and just no-selling Bowser's strength, despite them also saying that Bowser had the advantage in brute strength. And for two, there's a difference between saying specifically vulnerable to holy weapons and immune to everything that isn't holy weapons. Literally, the only thing I like about the conclusion is that the subspace emissary cutscene is played during the winner is Ganon part, but at the same time, 33 out of 100. Bowser vs. Eggman win. I mean, at this point, it's probably guaranteed to happen since they've already expressed a bunch of interest in it. If it's not gonna happen in season- My name's Ratchet. Your name is WHAT?! <laughs> Death Battle, dude! You really just put two of my most wanted episodes back to back! <laughs> okay, yeah, but yeah, I don't talk about this nearly enough, but I fucking love Ratchet and Clank. Unironically, one of the best platformer series ever. I've played and enjoyed a lot of the games, and along with Tales of Arise, Ratchet & Clank Rift Apart is my favorite game of 2021. Hell, I even got around to playing it during the waiting period of this episode. As for Jack & Daxter though, I don't have nearly as much experience or love for the series since I didn't give it too much thought when I first played it several years ago, but I did give them a second chance recently, and I do like Jack & Daxter as characters though. They are a good duo. The reason why this was one of my most wanted matchups has less to do with my love for Ratchet and Clank as well as my acknowledgement of the Jack and Dexter series, and more because of PlayStation All-Stars Battle Royale. Yeah, I know, I know, that game has some major flaws, yada 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 yada, but it's a game that gave me a lot of fond memories, more than most games are able to, by the way. And what do you know, Jack and Dexter was my main in that game alongside Ratchet and Clank, so yeah. You could bet the bottom dollar that I stole from your wallet that I was excited for for this episode. But then again, this is immediately following another one of my most wanted episodes that actively disappointed me. So let's see how good this episode is. Ratchet's analysis is based around the future trilogy story changes and doesn't focus too much on the story beats of the PS2 trilogy. This isn't a composite sort of thing, it's still the same Ratchet. And I am aware that the future trilogy was more popular, at least at the time, but Ratchet and Clank fans do have some issues with the story changes of the future trilogy, like the whole last Lombax thing, but that's neither here nor there, and it doesn't really impact the analysis at all. With saying all of the important feats and skills, followed by Boomstick mentioning the ballroom dancing and origami is very charming and taps into the silliness of the series. In fact, the dialogue was ripped straight from Going Commando. And the Rhino 5 section is awesome! Boomstick knowing about Tchaikovsky not just for the 1812 overture, but also for the cannons is a genuinely great gag. Yeah, Tchaikovsky actually did employ real cannons in his performances of his piece. Oh, and did you know that he also hated this piece because he believed it proved that people preferred spectacle over artistic expression and integrity? You know what? I think I'm with Tchaikovsky on this one. There are some YouTubers who make very low quality videos that regularly get millions of views and subscribers for some f***ing reason, yet my channel's been struggling to maintain above 1,000 subscribers, which thanks to all of you who subscribe, by the way. But even then, those subscribers mainly came from my death battle content that I started doing on this channel recently, as opposed to my non-death battle content, and side note, since you most likely haven't seen my death battle content, I'm making you suffer by forcing you to sit through this unskippable ad break! <laughs> But if you have seen at least three of my non-death battle videos, then you get extra bragging rights in the comments. Triple bragging rights if you left a like and comment on those videos as well. Okay, aside from all that, they talk about Clank's story and abilities very well. They go over their bond, and while Boomstick does call it corny, to be fair, that does sound like a joke you'd hear in classic Ratchet and Clank. Overall, I thought this analysis was awesome. Then again, that is because I'm a huge fan of the series, and I reckon somebody less knowledgeable on the series wouldn't get as much out of it. That was kind of my experience with Jack's analysis, since Daxter is kinda shit on a few times, and there are some clips that go on for a little too long, but it was still nice to learn about him. 
And while I am aware that Jack 2 is sometimes criticized for being too edgy, oh hey, I think I would know something about that, I'm glad that Death Battle didn't make any of those types of jabs, knowing that they absolutely could have done so. Boomstick's first words would have been a funnier joke if Boomstick just said, Oh, those were my first words too! Instead of what he ends up saying in the analysis. Oh, why am I talking about this? I want to talk about the fight! I instantly want to go over my favorite part of this fight, the characterization. Everyone sounds exactly as they should. I mean, of course, given that this is a 2v2 matchup, you kind of need to make sure that the characterization and banter is on point, and I can confirm that it is. Ratchet and Clank have the same chemistry that they do in the PS2 trilogy, where they lightly bicker with each other a couple of times, and Clank shows genuine concern for Ratchet when he's blasted in the air. Their teamwork is also spot on, from the subtle moments like them nodding at each other twice, twice to more direct moments like Clank freeing Ratchet from the time freeze and setting him up for the kill. Jack doesn't speak too much, but when he does, he has the same serious demeanor you'd expect him to have. And Daxter, okay, Daxter doesn't get to do too much, which I've seen people criticize this episode for, and I understand that, but in the episode's defense, that is an argument they make in the conclusion, but it would have been nice if Daxter got to do some. I still think he does a lot of great things though, like when he steers the missile and all, and some of his dialogue is also really funny. In fact, I also need to give a shout out to the dialogue of this episode and the voice acting. The only deliveries I don't like are Daxter's laugh when riding on the missile, Clank's laugh at the end, and Ratchet's let's try this, but they don't take me out of it at all. And the choreography is also creative, using most of both characters' entire arsenals and even getting some creative interactions out of them. I've always believed that some of the best moments in any death battle animation is when they're able to have a creative trading of abilities, and this one is chock full of them. I also gotta give a shout out to the environment. It looks very PS2-ish, which I mean in the best way. And finally, the Rhino 5 section. It's really good, has great music, missing sound effects, wait, what, what, what? And no, I don't think this was an intentional joke because there actually is a sound effect you can hear, and it's Ratchet getting slammed against the door. That's kind of annoying. I do like the kill though. It uses that great use of teamwork I mentioned earlier, and the way that Ratchet lands the killing blow just as the overture ends, curtain indeed. Yeah, in case you couldn't tell, I really like this episode, and it has been getting a lot more love recently, which I do appreciate. I think that this episode probably deserves an 84 out of 100. I say this because, like with the analyses, you kind of need to be a big fan of Ratchet and Clank and or Jack and Daxter to get the most from this episode. But guess whose voice you're hearing from right now? Yeah, my score for this episode is a 93 out of 100. I wouldn't exactly say it's one of the most underrated episodes of the show, not anymore since more people are talking about it, but at the same time, I think that the love this episode has gotten is more than deserved. <laughs> Okay, fresh off the train of Death Battle giving me two of my most wanted episodes back to back, with the second one making me happier than most episodes are able to, now Death Battle introduces my most wanted combatant of the time. Not to say that Flash vs Quicksilver was one of my most wanted, I just really really wanted to see Barry Allen on the show. Though why did his teaser have clips from Wally West as well? Ah well, who cares. But before we get into the episode though, there is one thing I need to point out. Remember the G1 prediction blogs I brought up in Dante vs Bayonetta? Well, from this episode onward, the people who worked on those blogs were official research members of the Death Battle team. Although the G1 prediction blogs would continue, they've consistently been run by different people. And I would like to point out that although Death Death Battle did take notes from them on occasion, they were never considered a part of the official team. So yeah, anyone who unironically still thinks that Dante vs Bayonetta was rigged because the team supposedly unanimously agreed that Bayonetta was supposed to win, you gain nothing from lying to the people. But enough about that, let's finally go into the episode itself. Going into the analysis, there is something minorly interesting. The Flash Gordon gag they use in the episode is actually slightly different from the preview. The Flash! Ah! The Flash! A part of me kind of prefers the effects they use in the preview, not gonna lie. But I really had to look to that preview to find something interesting because unfortunately, Barry's analysis was kind of boring. Not to say that the jokes were bad, I didn't really find them funny, but I wouldn't exactly say they're bad jokes either. Rather, it's more so that Boomstick's deliveries when covering Flash's crazier feats is... Weird for me to explain, but I don't like them. He's always pausing multiple times in between sentences for some reason, and it does kind of make the episode feel limp. And then he did it, all before the cops showed up. Oh, and he can run on clouds. 
Chad wasn't having an off day for his boomstick voice or anything. That thought instantly gets debunked by Quicksilver's analysis, but I don't know, something about it just feels weak. I do enjoy Quicksilver's analysis more, but at the same time, why is Magneto's theme from MVC3 playing here? I get that he's Magneto's son and all, but it doesn't change the fact that this still isn't his theme. And overall, it doesn't fit anything they talk about in the analysis. However, while most of the jokes fall flat for me, I do like the part where Boomstick fell over. And it's something that would be less funny if they used the animated Wiz and Boomstick they do today. Because they make Boomstick get hurt and fall over all the f***ing time. Whereas during the time of this episode, they didn't do those kind of jokes nearly as much. Along with that, the way they approach his backstory was pretty well done. Acknowledge Acknowledging that it's convoluted, yes, but covering it like they would any other backstory until they get to something weird, where Wiz gives his honest reaction. And then we get to the fight. Oh, hi, Poison. It's less of a fight and more of a race that they decide to have with one another while they wait for Lily Kane to fall to the ground. That is kind of fun, and the banter they have at the beginning is also pretty endearing. I do think these are some good voice performances. Anthony Bowling kind of reminds me of Chuck Huber's Iron Man, but in the best ways where he captures the laid-back and quippy parts of his character. But I like Edwin Tong as Quicksilver more, giving off a smug and pompous personality with distinct inflections. But as for the actual fight itself... I like how for the most part they stick with the theme of it being more of a race than a fight, but it does have some weird moments like this one exchange where their attacks keep whiffing. I mean, that's just kind of funny to me. And Flash blowing Quicksilver into the birds is, um... Also amusing, but doesn't make much sense when you remember that time is basically slowed down. Though a fun fact about the tornado scene, it originally had a different track in the old Screw Attack version. That being the second half of Cap's promise from Captain America Civil War. As opposed to the fight they use in the YouTube version, that being Joker's gang fight. I think the YouTube version has the better track for the scene, given that it maintains the casual race energy, while still implying that Flash is taking the race more seriously. And while I'm talking about music right now, I'd like to go back to the beginning and ask, why is Super Squall's theme playing? Did you guys just forget who Super Squall is as a character? Look, I get it, it has a fast tempo, but it also gives off a sense of urgency that really doesn't add up with the context of the episode itself. You know one I think would fit the best, or at least would be among the best? The music you're listening to in the background of this video right now. No, I'm serious. Take a gander and see for yourself. Or hear for yourself, I guess, because of Same difference! Fight! Watch him later. See how it fits the more casual vibe of this part of the episode? I have the full version linked as an unlisted video below if you want to check it out. But now that I've covered the episode's worst use of music, I'd like to talk about the episode's best use of music. That being the music choice of I Have to Try from the Flash CW show during the Speed Force scene. It really helps highlight Barry's incredible speech, as well as his final beatdown on Quicksilver, where he's progressively getting faster and faster. Along with Quicksilver's death scream, followed by, yes, a lame death, but come on, look at all of this! It's a genuinely hype moment otherwise. But enough about music, I'm sure that there's one question that you're definitely not thinking in your minds. How is the sense of speed? Well, I'm kind of mixed on it, really. I mean, on the one hand, you do have moments where their sense of speed is being conveyed through a simple line or a simple flash. <laughs> I did not mean to say that. That wasn't in the script, no. But on the other hand, given that this is a race across the coast, there are very minimal, unique visuals that make this episode feel like it's taking place in the same location, almost. As well as them moving slowly up a building, at least compared to the speed lines that they have. And the travel by map just says they're moving faster, but you just see them as dots on a line and eh, it doesn't work for me here. All leading up to an episode that's just kind of eh. I do like how in the conclusion, Wiz just outright says, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, this fight was a stomp. <laughs> it didn't stop the episode from being made, however, and it still doesn't dissuade them from doing matchups that are complete stomps. Can we normalize deleting the whole stomp equals bad argument that people like to throw around in the versus community? Please say yes, because I fail to see why the answer should be no. But otherwise, I do like some ideas that they have here, but unfortunately, I'd argue that the core of the episode has its problems. But I mean, 57 out of 100 could be a lot worse. <laughs> Okay, so earlier this year, the thumbnail got glitched to a frame of the Audible sponsor. They really do miss Nervous Nick, oh. 
but when they found out, instead of fixing it immediately, they replaced it with the same frame, but with Joker and Sweet Tooth covering their faces. <laughs> <laughs> that is peak comedy. Oh, and uh, they did eventually get around to fixing the thumbnail. It's back to normal now. I've always found this episode to be really interesting. More than most people would want to give it credit for. Joker's obviously an iconic character, and naturally, he'd be heavily requested to be on the show at some point. But his most popular opponents were Green Goblin and Kefka. Really, people? This is the best you got? In their defense, however, I'd argue that Joker is a difficult character to make work on Death Battle, but I'll get there when we talk about the fight. For now, I want to talk about these analyses and how I really like them. They cover Joker's character really well, starting off with saying that Gotham's bleak nature means you should find humor in anything, and making Joker's origin out to be a complete mystery. I mean, I think there's a canon explanation now, and no, I'm not referring to the Joaquin Phoenix movie. But either way, that was established after this episode, so who cares? And the way that the music cuts off after Boomstick says, Well, that's one way to kill the audience! And Wiz saying that Joker cutting off his own face is worse. <laughs> I like that banter they have. And Sweet Tooth's analysis, however, it is hard carried by the twisted metal music in the background. Seriously, why does it go so hard? I mean, I do really like metal a lot, but like, this is just astronomically better fitting for the analysis than I thought it would be. <laughs> really makes this analysis more engaging than it otherwise would be. And there's no cliche joke about Sweet Tooth's vehicle having the same name as Sweet Tooth. Thank goodness. And I also like the part where they talk about the electric chair because it has a decent joke that naturally flows into stats. And both analyses have a running theme of Boomstick expressing his hatred of clowns. Go figure. And then we get to the fight and, oh, that's the Joker mobile from the Arkham games. I mean, I've heard that it's from like a fever dream in that game, apparently. Mm, I like the model, but not really my color. You know, if any character without fourth wall breaking powers had to acknowledge that the canon is being broken, I feel like Joker would be one of them. Also, now that I played a clip from the show, I'd like to give another shout out to the voice actors. Lucas Shunman steals the show. In fact, he was so good that Ben casted Shunman to play Joker before he even finished listening to his audition clip. He really is that good at the role. But thankfully, that doesn't make this Joker featuring Sweet Tooth, as Gianni Matragano, the GOAT, does another great performance as Sweet Tooth. And with Sweet Tooth's more serious, murderous intent combined with Joker just f***ing around, this makes room for some nice banter potential that gives the fight a lot of personality, complete with a creative fight dynamic that focuses more on their individual dynamics rather than something that they both share. With it mainly being a fight between the ice cream truck and, uh, the Batmobile, I guess. But they do get some quote-unquote hand-to-hand combat, where Joker gets to use some of his gadgets and Sweet Tooth is outright resisting them. But Joker's not all fun and games though, as in the final moments, Joker gets to deliver a chilling speech. Not only does he have an ominous energy to him, but it still comes across like someone who would have a crowbar stuck in their body. And this leads into the kill and, oh man, the kill is so good. The distorted visuals coupled with the score and their laughter with Sweet Tooth's laugh having voice cracks just before he dies. Ooh. <laughs> oh, hey, the cop car clips through the bushes. Immersion ruined, bad episode. Anyways, the conclusion's fine. The outro clip, I'd assume, is uh, continued from the same scene because there is no outro clip. Whatever, whatever. There are a lot of people who want to see Joker come back, and I understand why, but personally, I've always thought that Joker is a character that's difficult to work with in the context of Death Battle, and also why this is one of, if not the best, means of getting him on the show in the first place. Not to say that it's my preferred opponent for Joker. I admittedly haven't put too much much thought into Joker's other opponents, but from what I understand of his matchups, at least when you don't include Emperor Joker, it's either he gets bodied and is virtually unable to do jack shit, or he just completely one-shots his opponent the moment he gets in. I mean, that is a weird thing to say because in theory, any attack that's stronger than a simple punch or kick would obviously be lethal, but I think it's more believable for a character to survive like being sliced with a sword than magically being able to survive an electric joy bomb that has the same output as the electric chair, or acid spray that's supposed to melt your face off, or a puff of smoke that causes you to suffocate due to uncontrollable laughter. And in Sweet Tooth's analysis, he's literally survived the electric chair, so he shouldn't have much issue being able to tank his joy buzzer. Although I don't think they brought up any reason as to why he would be able to survive Joker's acid spray, but I guess you could get over that by saying the acid melted his mask but not his face or something like that. I don't know. 
but the one deadly gadget he's unable to survive, the Joker Venom, is treated as the trump card it rightfully is. Whereas if Joker was fighting someone else, say like, um, Junko? Junko from Danganronpa? Let's go with that for now. I don't think she's able to survive the Joker Venom or any of his other gadgets. Maybe she is able to, I don't know. Any Danganronpa fans in the chat want to tell me as to whether or not she's able to? Or if this is actually a good matchup while you're at it? It would just be you waiting for Joker to pull out one of his gadgets, and that's just not what people want to see from the Joker. The way that modern death battle works in general just wouldn't let Joker's characterization flesh out like other people would want it to. Like, keep in mind, this fight is longer than five minutes. Very few episodes get even close to that, unless if it's the finale. And even then, they tend to cap at around four minutes. And Joker's the kind of character where you just need to let him flesh himself out. Otherwise, he loses a good chunk of what makes him such an iconic villain. At least to me, anyway. Ultimately, you could label this as more of a subjective thing, as Joker's most likely gonna come back to death battle anyway. I don't know if it will be as good as this episode, though, because I like this episode quite a lot. 81 out of 100. That might be a higher score than what most people would give it, but I'm definitely gonna need to give this season as much positivity as I can, given the episode that comes next. <laughs> Oh, here we go, dailies and mental gin. Mewtwo vs. Shadow, one of the least loved episodes in the show's history, if not the most hated one. There's been a lot of talk about what happened behind the scenes. The animator quit because he didn't want to make versus animations anymore. It was poorly made on purpose. He left Death Battle on poor terms. I was really interested to see what was going on with the animator's head during this time, as he only worked on one other episode. He did also work for DBX and One Minute Melee, but if he really quit animation as a whole after two episodes, that seems a bit extreme. Not unrealistic, as I'm no stranger to quitting jobs after a short amount of time because I was just not vibing with the workload, but I still feel like there was more to the story. So I did some digging to find a means of contacting the animator of this episode, Don, previously known as Donimations, and despite the Death Battle Wiki not having any of its social media handles, I found him. He asked me not to show our conversation, so unfortunately I'm not gonna show the conversation we had, nor am I gonna show his at, but rest assured, I did find him. Also, I asked him to proofread this part of the video, so, yep, it's time for the Jonathan Frostathan patented, fully scripted rundown. At least for the whole background context, because I feel like it really needs it. And since I don't have much to show, here's some No Context JoJo's Bizarre Adventure All-Star Battle R footage! Wait a minute, I think this is referring to some of that non-Death Battle content I was referring to earlier. Wait, this is from a video that's not even out at the time of this recording or at the time of this video? Well, you better make it to the premiere, I swear! The first claim is that he quit Death Battle for good because he didn't want to make versus animations anymore. This is technically right, as he hasn't had interest in making animations in the past five years, but there's more nuance to it. It stems from how he wasn't able to handle the pressures that stem from the creative process of animations, at least in comparison to other animators like Zack and Luis. And on top of that, his college semester was also starting to catch up on him, and he wasn't doing so well financially. The stress that came from this line of work caused him to rush his episodes out the door, and he just wasn't happy with the final product he dished out. You can kind of see this in Bowser vs. Ganon, where many abilities and interactions leave as quickly as they were introduced. But it reached a boiling point with Mewtwo vs. Shadow, in more ways than one. There was a bunch of content that he just couldn't deliver, such as the original way the fight would start would be that Shadow would attack and kill an Onyx that is actually moving towards a Chaos Emerald, rather than Shadow shooting at a random Zubat that's aimlessly flying in its vicinity. This could lead into the other claim that the fight was made poorly on purpose, but Don told me that it was straight up wrong. He did say there was a time where he said things not indicative of what actually occurred in production, but he didn't try to make the episode bad on purpose. Purpose. Like I said, it came from his gripes and struggles with the creative process, likely due to the release schedule. And on top of that, he had to make this episode during summer heat with broken AC. I'm pretty sure he was working remotely as opposed to within Rooster Teeth or Screw Attack's office, but still, that's a bad situation for anyone to be in. After this episode, he just threw up his hands and resigned. But he doesn't blame Screw Attack nor Hyun's Dojo for any bad experiences he had. 
He would later work on a few DBX episodes and help out with One Minute Melee, and while he did have a better mindset when animating those episodes, unfortunately his personal life just caught up with him and he had to quit versus animations in general. But despite all of this, he doesn't hold any grudges on the people he worked with. As far as I know, they're on good terms. Or at least Don told me that working with them wasn't bad at all. So yeah, hey, uh, people who work on the Death Battle Wiki, can you, uh, change all this information to what I said? Please say yes and do it. While I have very few nice things to say about Mewtwo vs. Shadow, I'd like to say that the animation has little to do with my criticisms. Mostly. I can't defend the lack of background and the fact that the animation in general is just lazy, but as far as jank, there's surprisingly not as much as I expected there to be. But we'll get there when we actually talk about the fight. For now, I want to talk about these analyses. Mewtwo's analysis was... okay. I mean, Mewtwo's literally one of two Pokémon I actually care about. He means a lot more to me than one would think. Though it does kind of disappoint me that this felt more like a respect thread, but it does have a couple of highlights. The joke about Mewtwo being weak to bugs was a fun jab. Yeah, that's pretty cool. But Shadow's analysis, on the other hand, I was fully expecting them to sh** all over his character, completely disrespecting him at every point in the episode. No. They don't do that. I mean, the worst you can say is that they said he has a terrible memory as a genuine weakness when that's not entirely true. And they skim over the second half of his backstory, but at least skimming over it is better than not including it at all. And to be fair, they do the same with Mewtwo, so thankfully there's not a lot of bias here. But otherwise, it was about as much of a respect threat as Mewtwo's was. Also, I Am the Eggman playing throughout the entire analysis was kind of weird. Now we get to the fight, and like I said earlier, I don't have too many complaints with the animation beyond it being late and the lack of a background at points. Rather, my qualms with this fight come from basically everything else. People like to complain that Shadow only gets one hit, but that's not the issue here. The only hits in the entire fight are Mewtwo redirecting Shadow's Chaos Spear, hitting Shadow with a spoon, Shadow's Chaos Control Kick, the Chaos Blast, which Mewtwo literally says it's too much, not sure how people could have missed that, these clashes where we don't see what's happening, and the Death by Spoon. That's a total of two hits we see per combatant, and four clashes from both characters where we don't see See what's happening. Again, this is not where the disrespect to Shadow comes into play. Unless if you want to try and claim that Shadow was being disrespected because Mewtwo blocked one of his attacks. I mean, if we're gonna follow that logic, then every loser on Death Battle was disrespected because they f***ing died. I don't think I need to explain to you that this is not how anything works. Be real. No, the disrespect comes in Shadow's characterization. Takahata was directed to act worse as a supposed homage to the cheesy voice acting from Sonic Adventure 2. Not sure why you would want to pay homage to that aspect of the game out of all things, especially knowing that they would eventually pay homage to cheesier moments in other games far more tactfully. This causes Shadow to be blatantly out of character for no reason. Things like being paranoid over a Zubat being a little close to the Chaos Emerald, boasting for a very long time in Super Shadow as opposed to just blitzing him immediately, and then there's the screw you at the end. At least the oh my god I'm glowing line is funny. Completely unnecessary and another slap in the face to Shadow's characterization, but at least it's funny. Not for the reasons they want, though. I guess Kerberfer does an alright job as Mewtwo, though I'm really not sure why he randomly feels like saying Shadow is annoying when he only said one line of dialogue. Also, why does Shadow stop attempting Chaos Control as he's saying Chaos Control? I don't care if his memory is getting warped. I highly doubt that it would instantly stop one of his key abilities. And yeah, the death is funny, but they're just weirdly obsessed with the whole spoon thing for pretty much no reason at all. And of course, there's a conclusion. It's easy to say that it's a load of bollocks because of how they gave Shadow superior speed and actual strength feats, and gave Mewtwo nothing but escape velocity speed and scaling to a lake lifting feat. But their argument was that Mewtwo could outhack Shadow via mind manipulation. I'd be okay with this if it weren't for the fact that they mentioned Mewtwo has better durability that would allow him to capitalize on it, which is also a moot point because they don't elaborate on Mewtwo's durability beyond surviving being impaled by tentacles. I'd also like to point out that the scene they used to justify being vulnerable to mind control is very ironic given that later on in that exact scene, it says literally the f***ing opposite, but I'll bite my tongue on that because that is technically outside factors. But Shadow the Hedgehog being the worst game ever? Really guys? Sure, it's not Shadow's game of origin, and Sonic fans are very split on this game, with some even citing it as the source of the decline in writing quality for most of the Sonic games from this point onward, but come on, it's not even the worst Sonic game. That easily goes to Sonic Chronicles of Dark Brotherhood. It's a Sonic game with bad music for f***ing 
sake. Now, normally I'd be one of those people who's just all like, this animation's so bad, Grah! But I really, really can't bring myself to do that. And I was originally gonna give this a surprisingly not terrible score out of spite. And no, I am not spiting who you think I'm trying to spite. I can't even bring myself to do that ironically for one simple reason. This was yet another one of my most wanted matchups. Bowser vs. Ganon actively disappointed me, but this? Given all the context I'd given, I just feel nothing. Real shame that this is the best Mewtwo's got. Shadow's got one more episode, but we'll get there when we get there. But until then, 22 out of 100. At least it's better than Ragna vs. Soul. <laughs> This is a special episode, and is what I would consider to be why the season only has 14 episodes instead of 16. Because this wasn't just a death battle episode, this was an official episode of Red vs. Blue. This is one of Ben's favorite episodes he's ever worked on, and it's something he's been trying to do for years. And yeah, Red vs. Blue isn't really a show that interests me, just because it's not really my kind of thing. Though I do like the memes, and I'm sure that it's a great show. And I can't deny its influence that it had on Ben, Chad, and internet and entertainment as a whole, especially since Torian moved on to animate for that series, so good for him. But despite being one of the more slept on episodes of the season, this ironically stands out more than any of them because of the narrative within the episode itself. It's literally just the two arguing about who would win in a fight between the meta and Carolina, and Caboose just so happens to have the contact information of Wiz and Boomstick. Something tells me this was why he was the only survivor in Red vs. Blue, but shh. The only other episode I can say has something of a narrative like this is Macho Man vs. Kool-Aid Man, but even then it's not to the same level. I'm not able to tell if this is in line with the writing style of Red vs. Blue, but to me, it's funny, and I have seen Red vs. Blue fans happy with this episode. The cutaway gags felt like a modern-day death battle episode if the gags were actually funny. I like the running gag of Boomstick abusing Griff where he starts off using him as a guinea pig for the weapon and tool demonstrations, developing enjoyment from it, and abusing him just because he thinks it's fun. And the bit where Griff tried to question how they got all this footage and where they somehow didn't see the twist of text coming were also pretty endearing. If I had to come up with any complaint, it would be the setup of this fight. Didn't the analysis establish that the meta died? yet he just casually comes back with no explanation. I'm sure there's a reason for it, but they treat this as a canon episode of Red vs. Blue. I would just like some more elaboration on that is all. Otherwise, the fight is really solid. It has some cool interactions, some nice choreography, it's well animated, and my favorite bit, the banter between Carolina and Church is really good. And it also ties into the conclusion how they have a better relationship than the meta does with his epions. I said that wrong. No, no. I'm gonna call them all Epion because I think it's funny. <laughs> I also like the climax, how Carolina's using her full arsenal only to just get no celled by the time stop. So Carolina has to rely on Church to stall the meta, who is able to steal the meta's weapon and kill him with it. Yeah, that's awesome. Unfortunately, I don't have too much to say about the fight itself. Maybe that's why more people don't talk about it, but I will say Slingshot is a phenomenal track. And the fact that it's composed by the composers of the Red vs. Blue series is awesome! And I also like the ending bit, which is the start of the running joke of Sarge being Boomstick's father. Which is actually even funnier when you realize that Chad's voice from Boomstick is heavily inspired by Sarge. That's pretty cool, not gonna lie, Boomstick. Overall, I don't have that much to say, but it's a really good episode and I think you should give it a watch. 79 out of 100. Not enough to get me into Red vs. Blue, but if you're a Red vs. Blue fan, I assure you this is a great episode. This is the first episode animated by Luis Cruz, originally a G1 member who would eventually become Death Battle's lead 2D animator. Ben watched his Mario Meet Your Maker animation and was impressed enough to give Luis a test run after his DBX of Ronald McDonald vs. Colonel Sanders, with his animations having a more comedic edge to them. So naturally, the best debut possible would be with two military women where the connection is that they are human women and a boring ass Street Fighter vs. Mortal Kombat rivalry. Yeah, not even the Death Battle week it can make this matchups sound more interesting. <laughs> oh no, they slow down the fight card immensely and it looks so bad because they still show the fight text. <laughs> Man. Kami's analysis is kind of there. I like her Street Fighter 4 theme playing throughout the whole thing, because it is a very, very good theme, but that's the most I got. I guess I kind of like the horny boomstick joke at the end. Never thought I'd say that. It's funny how Wiz placed a bet on whether or not he could keep it in his pants, but then they keep going for no reason. Hmm. <laughs> 
and Sonya's analysis is also fine, but man, this sound balancing is terrible. The music is way too loud, which makes it difficult to hear anything Wiz and Boomstick are saying. I guess Dronya was a surprisingly alright joke. And another thing I found unintentionally funny was, for something that they say happens in the blink of an eye, that is one slow backflip. But then again, bad analyses can still make for a good fight animation, right? Well, I mean, did you see the sprites they had earlier? Did you notice how the characters' the sprites don't match each other at all? Yeah, I think that should give you a good sense as to how this is going down. It just had bad animation all over it. This beatdown looks bad, but that may be because of the sprites Louise had to work with, so fair enough. But this animation of Cammy throwing a box looks so odd. Her character select portrait being used twice, twice in succession, once for an admittedly decent shot of her unleashing her psycho power, and one for a really bad landing animation where her eyes seem to be bugging out. And Sonya has her character select icon too? Why? And... <laughs> that f***ing spin? Never since Darth Vader have I seen a spin animation looking this stupid. <laughs> oh, but there are multiple parts where white keeps flickering over and over again. It starts when Cammy damages the drone with her knife, where the lights flicker for a whole seven seconds. Then Cammy gets hit with a shock grenade, where the lights flicker for about two more seconds. And then the drone randomly crashes into the oil barrel, and the lights flicker for another three seconds. If you're good at basic math, then you'll realize that that is 12 seconds of flashing lights. Oh, and there's no seizure warning, by the way, so, uh, oops. I will say that the kill is really good. The fire from the oil barrel sets the atmosphere really well, and the visuals from Sonya's attacks not only reference the X-ray moves from Mortal Kombat 9, but they even reference the Kami Quick combination, which they say snaps her opponent's bones three times. And they're even similar to the bones that Kami snaps in that super as well. And this shows that Sonya has so much better experience in training than Kami that she can just use Kami's strongest super better than she can. That's quite the power move, I tell you what. And then it ends with her fatality, but it doesn't look like the same fatality, but seeing Cammy struggling to break free and screaming in fear, she's getting squeezed in half. <laughs> I mean, torn in half is priceless. I don't like the outro clip though. Cammy's corpse manspreading and Sonya runs over her corpse with a car. But aside from the death, I was not expecting this episode to be this sloppy. Not just in the fight, but in the analyses as well. I'll be honest, Mewtwo vs. Shadow is definitely the worst episode, but even that one didn't feel as sloppy, because at least the audio mixing and the character rundowns were adequate. I can't even say that for this one. All it means is that it's a bad episode for a fittingly bad matchup. 28 out of 100. Really should have been Cammy vs. Leona or Nina Williams. <laughs> Man, this season has a lot more infamous episodes than I remember. But I'll be honest, it was very difficult for me to decide as to what I actually thought about it. For this ranking retrospective alone, this was the episode I had to rewatch the most. At least for the fight animation, but we'll get there soon. Tracer's analysis was kind of decent. I get that there wasn't much to work with, but learning about her origins was pretty cool. And although there's a lack of feats in the analysis, it does give them time to let some of her story beats sink in, which I at least appreciate. And as for Scout's analysis, I do like the first half of it. TF2 lore is really funny with how surprisingly deep it gets, despite having such an ironically stupid premise. And Scout's backstory in particular was a fun revisit, nuancing his character as somebody who needed to run really fast. But but then we get to the second half, and it's not bad, it's only somewhat frustrating retroactively. Virtually everything they said about Bonk was bad though. I guess you could say they completely missed the point of what it does. Ah! Aside from that, there's not much to complain about for me when it comes to Scout's analysis. As someone who grew up with TF2 memes, videos, and of course, the game itself, I still got some enjoyment out of it. But then we get to the fight. And like with Mewtwo vs Shadow, neither character gets a lot of actual hits, but unlike with that episode, it makes sense given the most recognizable traits of the characters are that they're fast and that they have low HP. And I do know why people loathe this episode, but I think there are some positives that go largely ignored. Octopimp Scout is a mixed bag for me. On the one hand, it is a good impression of the character. Albeit, I did notice a tinge of New Yorker in what's supposed to be a Boston accent. I do like some of his lines though. And I also thought it was charming seeing him get nervous after looking at Tracer's buttocks. It honestly reminds me of how flustered he got when trying to ask Miss Pauling out on a date in the expiration date video. And the references worked in pretty naturally given that that everyone was obsessing over Tracer's butt for some reason. 
looking back, I really don't understand what people were freaking out over. I mean, it's not even that big of a butt. No joke, my ass is thicker than Tracer's and I'm built like a twig. That said, Scout's characterization does have some major problems. The first is admittedly kind of minor in comparison, but I would have expected Scout to do a lot more sh** talking than not doing any at all. I mean, yeah, he does tend to respect Whammon, but as he's taking the fight more seriously and literally says, I never play fair. I would have liked for him to give some quippy one-liners or derogatory insults. Okay, maybe not that derogatory, but you know, something like the funny lines he has towards the other mercs in TF2. But it's not as bad as the biggest problem with Scout's characterization, if not the entire episode as a whole. Scout doesn't run nearly enough. He only runs a little bit at the beginning before he even sees Tracer, and this little parkour section here. Ben has two explanations for this. The first is that this episode had to be made within six weeks. Sure, that was the case for other episodes in this season, and season two would do 3D fights almost every other episode. But remember that it would often be three months before those episodes were released. That's a bit longer than six weeks. And Ben claims that the fight needed to be simplified due to Torian's workload actively hindering his health, which also explains why the next 3D episode had to be pushed back a bit. In fact, he did notice it before this episode, but unfortunately he couldn't change the release date in time. Sometimes it happens. But I can't quite understand his second explanation, where he claims that the arena doesn't have a lot of room to run around. They say that, but Tracer is still doing some running here and there, and yeah, she's using her blink ability way more often, but she still has to run to use it, and she even uses some admittedly pretty cool aerial maneuvers with it. Oh, and another reason why the second half of Scout's analysis is bad retroactively is because they directly say that Scout has the ability to mid-air jump, gaining five mid-air jumps while under the effects of Bonk. He does not do a single mid-air jump at any point in the fight. And aside from the two moments where he's running, he's either walking slowly or standing. Oh, and I haven't even talked about the bonk scene. It's, it's so bad, you guys. I get that they wanted to go for a moment similar to Dante getting eaten by Gamora, but it doesn't work because bonk isn't like Dante's healing factor. Though it does lead to this cool moment here with Scout using his bonk and bat to try and get a hit on Tracer's blink now that he's able to keep up with her. Wait, wait, is Scout actually swinging at nothing while standing still under the effects of Bonk. I mean, I guess if you want to be technical, Scout doesn't even have the ability to attack while under the effects of Bonk, but I mean, uh, I guess given that he doesn't use a gun, the suspension of disbelief can apply here. But then you have this scene where Scout lethargically turns around and misses Tracer. It really shows that there could have and should have been more interesting choreography. There is some fun characterization here and there, but it really halts the pacing with how slow he turns around. Also, Scout knocks Tracer very far away with his bat, which yeah, I do like this shot, but this would have been the perfect time for Scout to do some more running. But instead, he apparently just teleports to Tracer's location and again, walks slowly towards her when he has her at gunpoint. Point. But aside from that, I do like plenty of other moments. Mortified by Anarchy Reigns is an amazing track for the matchup. Maybe not for the animation in particular since they aren't moving nearly enough, but it's a really banging track and side note, Anarchy Reigns has a godlike soundtrack, go listen to it. And Elsie Lovelock as Tracer is honestly one of the most underrated performances of the entire show if you ask me. Plus Tracer gets a lot of other cool moments like the previously mentioned blinking parkour, yes I'm gonna call it that, as well as her reaction to her blink shorting out. The recall scene isn't too great though. <laughs> wow. And I kinda like the kill. Tracer's Yankee line is pretty endearing and sticking the pulse bomb right on Scout's back led to a good line from him. The explosion is bigger than the previous pulse bomb for some reason, but eh, whatever. I also like the outro clip which features Archimedes flying out from Scout's hat. It's weird that he survived, but I do like the reference to Archimedes being left within Scout's heart like in Meet the Medic, and how they bring it up in a sidebar from his analysis. And on Tracer's side, it's literally just a Pulp Fiction reference. Based. I wish I could get the same enjoyment from the conclusion. Now, I know a lot of people say that Scout should have won, but from the research I've looked into, Tracer actually does win, or at least it's perfectly reasonable to make an argument for Tracer beating Scout. But I will say that Death Battle's way of proving her W is probably the worst way to go about it. You say that we don't see the impact of the rockets, but I think the literal POV shot from the rockets means that they were definitely being fired directly at Scout. And for some reason, they also treat it as an anti-feat anyway, given that they say those rockets can one-shot 
far tougher mercs? Why does that matter though? They casually say that Tracer has better abilities. Um, and oh my lands, I literally just realized that this is Ben 10 versus Green Lantern before Ben 10 versus Green Lantern. Only this time they don't have the black boxes. I mean, yes, they do say that Tracer's reaction speed is a lot faster than Scout's, but the feat they use is pretty vague and it's just a blink feat. Talk about the abilities. That's what your argument should be about. In fact, that's probably the biggest issue with this episode that not a lot of people talk about. They don't give Tracer nearly as many feats as Scout, and what they do give her is just not elaborated on. This likely ties into how the episode aired only three months after Overwatch released. They had so little to work with, and it was virtually impossible for them to prove Tracer would win. Thankfully, the G1 blog has better arguments, but that's only because they had resources that Death Battle likely didn't have during this episode's production. I feel like this would have been been much better received if this was a season 4 episode. Yeah, you could have people complaining that Scout lost, but at least Death Battle would have more to work with. They'd be able to do a better job at proving why Tracer would win. Or they would find some new TF2 feats that proved Scout would win. But yeah, this episode has some major flaws. But I like smaller aspects about it. I went back and forth as to how good this episode was, mostly comparing it to the likes of Luigi vs. Tails in part of how terrible their conclusion was, and Beast vs. Goliath due to having a fundamental misunderstanding of the matchup. But I do think it's at least better than that episode in that regard since they have Tracer running around and using her blinding speeds. Though it's definitely worse than Luigi vs. Tails, I will say. Because that episode is still technically right by its own logic. So my final score for this episode is a 39 out of 100. But don't worry my fellow TF2 fans, they've shown interest in Soldier vs. Sarge and I think Spy vs. Agent 47, so I feel like it's only a matter of time before we get another TF2 episode. But don't expect it to feature Scout though. Sorry! <laughs> This episode has had quite the Cinderella story. Originally, it was hit with a copyright claim that blocked it in a few select countries and had to be re-uploaded. But the problem was that one of its thumbnails had the background from Mewtwo vs. Shadow- <coughs> had a green screen in it. So it looked kind of unprofessional. This caused it to be the least viewed episode in the show's history, especially since no one put too much thought into it. Unlike other episodes, which tend to gather at least 2 million views within its first few weeks, this episode struggled to get up to 500 thousand views. But then along came Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, where they announced Terry Bogard for the first Fighters Pass, and then all of a sudden, this episode started popping up a lot more often on YouTube, and lo and behold, it finally got more attention, currently sitting at more than 2.2 million views. Which is still low in comparison to the other episodes of the season, but at least it's still in tandem with other Death Battle episodes. But now that I finally revisited it, Ken's analysis was good. They covered everything they needed to, and then some. The Shin Ryuken is supposedly what caused the episode to get taken down, but if it was because they showed a clip from the movie, why did the Shin Ryuken bit get blurred out? That's just a little weird, but it doesn't hurt the episode though. The stuff they said about Ken Ken's cocky attitude is a little wrong because the words they use show that Ken laughs at his opponents after knocking them down, yet the analysis claims that it's something he does in the middle of a fight, but again, doesn't hinder the episode for me. And on the other side of things, I like Terry's analysis a lot more than I thought I would. The geese joke was a decent running gag at the beginning, his backstory got me engaged, they name dropped plenty of less popular characters from SNK's library, and they started off by bringing up how Terry had nothing to his name, and then go into how he got his title as the legendary Hungry Wolf. Mwah! Even more pitch perfect than the last pitch perfect note. Honestly, this was on the same level of quality as most of season 2's rundowns. I'm serious, it really is that good. But then the fight, once again animated by Luis Cruz, starts with Ken beating Dan in a fight, with Sean, Blanca, and Sakura in the background. This is a very nice touch because Sean is Ken's student, so he's likely taking some pointers from watching him, and Blanca and Sakura are Dan's friends, and they're cheering him on in his fight. Then Terry shows up and says, HEY, I'MMA BEAT YOUR ASS! And then Ken's like, I bet. It starts as a casual sparring match with them being as flashy as they can be, but showing some restraint. But let me tell you, this is some fun personality here. Terry's breakdance especially gives me life. 
and they start using some of their special moves, but eventually they get so into their fight that they start tearing the place down. But it doesn't come out of nowhere. This scuffle here is fast paced, but it's pretty tame, apart from Ken punching Terry in the cock. Then Terry starts using stronger attacks that break a pillar in the dojo, with both characters using fire in their attacks, with Ken responding with an impactful Hadouken. And then they start getting heated. Everyone gets out of the dojo through one of the walls that they already broke, except for Dan who dies by being crushed by a pillar. Dan is the only death battle combatant to die twice without actually returning, you'll love to see it. Oh, and there's this awesome shot of Terry using a Buster Wolf, and Ken responding, mm, Amazing Shoryuken! And then there's this scene where Ken starts charging up his Shinku Hadouken, which, um... He doesn't actually have and is only ever used in, uh, I believe, X-Men vs. Street Fighter? Or was it Marvel Super Heroes vs. Street Fighter? Either way, it was one of the Marvel Capcom fighting games. Eh, who cares? It still leads to this excellently masked bits that mesh really well with each other, all leading up to an ending that is kinda lame. I like the power guys are hitting Ken, but then it cuts back to him and it barely looks like he took more damage than earlier than he was panting heavily. And then Terry pulls out his Star Dunk Volcano and magically wins. Okay, look, they're shitting the bed, and then there's leaving diarrhea all over the goddamn bedroom. And that's kind of what this episode does. I mean, this shot of Terry in the outro clip looks badass, though I don't like how the conclusion has Boomstick obsessing over Eliza for no reason. That's obnoxious. You're saying what we're all thinking, Wiz. That was literally the last thing on my mind, but okay. But honestly, all this poor ending means to me is that it's a little bit worse than Ryu vs. Scorpion, which, by the way, I consider to be the gold standard for good fighting game episodes of Death Battle. And if you remember, that one also had an anticlimactic ending. So you know what I'm gonna give this episode? 83 out of 100. This, in my opinion, is the most underrated episode of the season, if not the entire show. Please, give it a watch if it's been a while since you've seen it, or if you haven't seen it already. It is 1000% worth your time. Now, you're probably wondering, unless if you're not, that this episode was actually much earlier in the season. So what took so long to talk about the Screw Attack Steam Sale versus your wallet? Well, the reason why it took me so long to talk about it is because it's actually very relevant to the point I'm trying to make. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. This is the most inaccurate death battle of all time. You can keep your Ben 10 versus Green Lanterns, your Yang versus Tifas, your Gata versus Toffs, all of that is unanimously correct compared to the Screw Attack Steam Sale versus your wallet. And do you want to know why I say that? They don't just say that the Screw Attack Steam Sale is fighting a wallet, but your wallet, implying that this will directly have a real world impact on you, but I have waited several months and several treacherous episodes, and nothing. My wallet still has all the money in it. I have not bought any of these games. And not only that, but it's also incorrect by its own logic. They said that wallets used to be able to carry dried meat, and the Screw Attack Steam Sale got nothing in terms of stats. Nothing! Oh, and on top of that, when you get to the fight, it looks pretty even at first, but then they randomly bring up another game that was on sale for $2. That wasn't even in the analysis! What the hell? Ben Singer, Chad James, if you're watching this, you should be ashamed of yourselves! You have lost your biggest fan! I'M NEVER GONNA WATCH ANOTHER DEATH BATTLE EPISODE EVER AGAIN! I still think about how people genuinely thought Amy was gonna fight Harley Quinn back in the day because... Hammers? <laughs> But yeah, this episode has started getting a lot of hate recently. Originally just being an episode that was just, mmm, not good, but not terrible either. But all of a sudden, I've seen constant vitriol for this episode, so I was kind of interested as to how I would feel about it. I mean, that probably has something to do with this episode being bumped ahead one spot to give Torian a little break before finishing Hulk vs. Doomsday. But at the same time, color me shocked to find plenty of enjoyment from Amy's analysis. And this is coming from someone who doesn't even like Amy that much. The way that Wiz blatantly tries to accept that Amy has all these crazy powers and how she has a natural understanding of tarot cards was actually kind of humorous. And then Boomstick obsessing over the hammer tornado thing that he says, <laughs> Ham NATO? <laughs> it's... <laughs> It didn't make me laugh this hard when I watched the episode, but ham NATO is such a stupid word, I love it. <laughs> Show the fucking hamster wheel. 
And then the hooked on Sonic's gag is apparently a reference to an episode from Sonic Sat AM where Antoine becomes jealous of Sonic's popularity and tries to take on Eggman himself. Okay, voice crack aside, that's a brilliant reference, not gonna lie. I probably could have done without the whole ultimate stalker running joke since I'd argue that hasn't been an important part of our character for well over a decade at this point. But as for Ramona's analysis, wasn't as fun and it's also kind of surprising that it wasn't that fun given that the writer of the episode was a huge fan of Scott Pilgrim, but it has some highlights. Boomstick reacting to Ramona's purse being a pocket dimension by saying, Gay! Like he just accepts that it's how women keep things in their purse. But then it's established that we're still unironically making jokes about writers being on drugs. Heroin. And by that I mean a strong female protagonist. Hey -o! oh! okay, fair enough. That joke was so dumb that it reverses back to being funny. So yeah, I did enjoy myself in these rundowns. Can't say the same for the fight. No idea why Ramona was the aggressor when they later say Ramona was the more level-headed of the two. And also, why is there no voice acting? Did time constraints really impact the voice acting that much? There is a dynamic between Amy being more hot-headed and Ramona being more level-headed. Why would you not want to capitalize on that? Or at the very least, how come you didn't reuse any voice clips from their games? I don't know if Ramona has any that you can use, but I know for a fact that Amy does. I guess the first part of the fight has some cool things in it. I mean, it has some decent back and forth. I kind of like Amy's spin dash maneuver. Some of the sound design is all right, but I'm just gonna say it. I don't think Night of Nights is a fitting track for this episode. Don't get me wrong. I love Night of Nights as much as the next guy, but what does it really say about the matchup? And since it's the only track you hear, it's kind of bizarre that this is a season three episode with no Sonic music, no Scott Pilgrim music, and no music that resembles it. I mean, to go back to the previous Sonic episode, Episode, the other previous Sonic episode, Impulse to Victory from the Dragon Ball Budokai series was a great track to go with. Sure, it's not from Donkey Kong Country or a Sonic, but it fits the matchup very well with a fun jazz theme to it, as well as the electric guitar that sounds like something you'd hear from a Sonic game. Plus, it fits the tone of the fight incredibly well. Night of Nights doesn't fit Amy vs. Ramona at all. The only place where you could say it fits is within the purse dimension, where I guess we're on Rainbow Road, sure. And it could be saved by the Ramona army scene, which starts off pretty cool, but then it just ends with Amy one-shotting them off-screen. Then we're just out of the purse dimension, sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this shot of Scott made me laugh, I'll admit. But the kill is such a mess. The build-up has Amy doing these lethargic jumps, literally unanimated. The editing is bad with it focusing on these arcade machines instead of Ramona for some reason. And then Amy knocks the last arcade machine onto her body. I mean, I thought that hitting her head with that giant hammer would at least be enough to knock her out, but okay. Points for uniqueness, I guess. But they forgot to add a sound effect for the arcade machine crashing onto the ground. Oops. I guess I like Scott reacting to Ramona's death in the angel form in the outro clip. That was a nice touch. I don't know why Sonic was here. Was he watching the fight the whole time? Nah, uh, ah, uh, whatever. I don't outright hate this episode, as it does have less problems than Tracer vs. Scout, but instead of actively disliking it, I'm just consistently confuzzled throughout the entire animation. 44 out of 100. Yeah. In spite of how mixed this season was, this and Dante vs. Bayonetta are considered placed on the highest regard as far as season 3 episodes go. With many people say that it rivals the quality of Tony vs. Lex, Snake vs. Sam, Deadpool vs. Deathstroke, and many fan favorites that would come after. And going by the analyses alone, Hulk's analyses was really good. It focused on his anger more than his coexistence with Banner, but given the context of the matchup, it makes perfect sense. I also like the boomstick dad joke and when he said Hulk's dad's arm could take him in places <laughs> like the nut house those were good jokes i like the humor here but doomsday's analysis is even better they went fully in depth on his creation to a point where it takes a minute and a half of his five minute analysis to finish talking about his backstory it's not to a point where they bring a bunch of useless garbage that ultimately adds nothing to the episode here they say a good joke about the youtube comments section being based around what if all you feel was hatred and aggression so when they cover his backstory as well as the experiments that led him to becoming the ultimate baby, which is supposedly a reference to something, 
Cool. It adds so much weight to when they start talking about Doomsday and how much of a monster he truly is. And that's to say nothing of the background music that's being used here. On top of that, they make a nice callback to the baby cannon joke from Yoshi vs. Riptor, and his end clip, while not as good as Hulk's, was still pretty nice. And now we get to the fight. Wait, Sanic, what are you doing here? I did say this was the other fan favorite, but I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. I think that this is the most overrated episode of the entire series. Saying that you can't criticize the outdated visuals is completely irrelevant given how many 3D episodes came before this with better models. Hell, even Tracer vs. Scout looked really nice in spite of Tracer's costume colors being a little too muted. The only 3D episodes that I can say look worse than this are Link vs. Cloud 2012 and Yang vs. Tifa. But even then, nobody's going easy on how bad those episodes look. So here I'm just too distracted by the untextured humans and Hulk's ugly looking and animating model to care. I guess Doomsday's model is better, but I'm not a fan of his stupid ponytail clipping through his head throughout the entire fight. Hell, sometimes their bodies just straight up don't move after taking a punch. Don't people praise this episode for having such a raw sense of impact? Because as we all know, death battle episodes have never had any impact in their attacks at any point in the history of the show! But this episode stands out objectively more than those because, 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 uh, uh, um, uh, uh, logic, reasoning, and lack thereof? Yeah, it's the Versus community. That checks out. Is the sound design bad? No. Well, aside from this part here. Okay, so it's cool that you were able to add the sound effect of all the windows being shattered, and it's also nice how you eventually added the sound effect of the rubble falling to the ground, which to be fair, the rubble in this episode is genuinely amazing and very impressive when you consider the rendering issues that would likely have come from this episode. God bless this episode getting a delay for real, but I think you may have forgotten to add the sound effect of DOOMSDAY BREAKING THE F***ING BUILDING! Also, everyone praises this scene of Doomsday throwing a bus and then drop kicking through it. What I'm trying to ask is, uh, why is Hulk still here after being drop kicked? I'm pretty sure that a basic kick has been able to knock him back at least a little bit, so, uh, why is he still standing here? And people say that the death has the best death of the series. I'd argue that Bayonetta's death is better, and Goku Black's death eclipses this in every way. Don't at me. But it's still a really, really good death. Except for the part where Hulk's head is just not moving, and people like to say, Oh, this last Doom shows how Hulk has failed to save this city. I actually think I would agree with that sentiment if they didn't blatantly reuse this exact voice clip from a generic punch that Doomsday does much, much earlier in the fight. <laughs> But okay, I'm getting a little too sarcastic here, because as much as I think this episode is overrated, and as much burnout as I've been feeling from everyone constantly saying this is peak death battle, Hulk vs. Doomsday is still a good episode. And there is definitely a lot to love about it. Like I said, the detail of the rubble is genuinely impressive. And there are also some other moments like the car boxing gloves. <laughs> Alright, I can't stay mad at an episode that uses cars at boxing glove. And the thunderclap scene, I disagree with the sound design being better than most attacks on the show. But to be fair, I like the added attention to detail of them adding Doomsday's ears ringing so that you can actually hear it from his perspective. And it has some pretty nice visual effects as well, with Doomsday looking like he's struggling to walk through it. That's really cool. And Hulk's line during his transformation is genuinely badass. And the music in this fight? Mmm. Hot Wind Blowing and Sky Should Be High are great tracks for this fight. They're heavy, they have vocals that go hard. This is the type of music I prefer in a Hulk episode. Oh, and one last point about the death. Here's an attention to detail I noticed. He doesn't just rip Hulk's head off of his spine, but he also jams the spike from his knee into his neck, which is what allows him to tear it off at all. That is raw. In the conclusion, okay, I'm aware that this is some headcanon bullshit, but it feels like a mix between the older analyses, which go by assumptions and logic, and the current analyses, which use far more evidence. And by far more evidence, I mean just one comic book panel where Sentry was able to overtax Hulk's rage. But much like with Goku vs. Superman 1, obviously the conclusion has major problems. He regularly fights foes with light speed capabilities, while that kind of speed is an extreme rarity in the Marvel Universe. An extreme rarity in the Marvel Universe. An extreme rarity in the Marvel Universe. Quicksilver can run well over 670 million miles per hour. Okay. I still think that the presentation alone shows that there was definitely a noticeable level of effort put into it that kind of makes me overlook it. Though it's fine if you can't overlook it. But yeah, sorry to the people who love this episode and think it's their favorite of the season. Props to you, but for me, 
76 out of 100. Standing here, I realize that I don't know what the hot take is in this situation. The fact that I think the character rundowns are better than the fight itself, or the fact that I gave it a lower score than Ken vs. Terry, and Joker vs. Sweet Tooth, and Meta vs. Carolina. Hmm. I'm just gonna say it, this episode is literally Gata vs. Toph if it was actually good. I make this comparison because this debuts the new series with two characters who are popular but not exactly the main character of the story. I'm serious, you have some fun analyses, which uh, sure not all the jokes land, but I like the Neapolitan ice cream comparison, and I also liked learning about Zoro's backstory and the weird adventures they have in One Piece. And on top of that, he also has the world's shittiest sense of direction. This is the most relatable thing ever said on the show to me. In Eris' analysis, not covering more backstory makes more sense because of her multitude of armors. You kinda need to talk about all of them, especially with how much they use in the fight. But what they did include was nice. Although Zoro's analysis had one joke that I thought was okay, Erza's analysis has no jokes I find funny. Which, okay, I guess Gata vs. Toph technically outclasses in that regard, but you know where it loses? The fight? There's something of a comedic edge to it, supported with some very talented voice actors. Kaiju Tang has some great lines here and there, and I like his deliveries. And Caitlin Barr as Erza is pretty good. It's a good voice that doesn't have a lot of memorable lines, but that's not a problem for me. And the sprite rigging and movements are really good, leading to some great animation overall. Like Zoro panicking after catching fire being a funny moment that doesn't stop the pacing of the fight, it matches the writing style of Louise's previous animations, where he's able to have the animation take a little break to tell a joke or or let the fight take a breather without changing the pacing in the slightest. Whereas in other episodes, whenever they decide to stop and let the fight breathe or tell a quirky one-liner, it often changes the pacing. Sometimes it's necessary, sometimes it's not, and sometimes it's the absolute defense. When compared to Louise's other episodes on the show so far, Ken vs. Terry had a lot of personality, but had a few small issues in terms of its writing. Though I do think that its attempts at humor are stronger overall. And Cammy vs. Sonya had no personality and no attempts to be funny, and even though it didn't once take time to breathe, it somehow feels like it has awful pacing. But you do gotta start somewhere, and I think Zoro vs. Erza is the best of both worlds. Especially since there's technically nothing in inherently wrong with the animation, aside from this blurry looking Zoro sprite here, but that didn't affect the overall writing of the episode. Though it's weird how they say that the Armadura fairy armor is her strongest armor, but she then transforms into a supposedly weaker armor with a weird looking transform effect. Though I have heard that them saying Armadura fairy armor is no longer considered her strongest armor, but I don't watch this show, so someone tell me in the comments. And going back to the comparisons with Gara vs. Toph, it also tried to do this sort of thing, but actively failed, because that episode had Bowser vs. Ganon tier pacing. And while I do still like the voice acting and some of the dialogue, none of its attempts at humor were funny. Either way, it leads to an awesome ending with Erza sending down dozens of swords, forcing Zoro to use his nine sword style and hop across the swords to get to the final blow, which is another amazing one-stroke duel that not only cleaves Erza in half, but it also splits the mountain as well. And Zoro still took damage from that. I think. But this adds another great use of power creep, with Zoro destroying a house that has more impact than anything in Hulk vs. Doomsday, Don't at me. Erza's attack obliterating the town they're fighting in, and then the killing blow busting a mountain in the background, which apparently also references a feat they bring up in the conclusion. Though it's funny because 11.5 megatons is city level. That is not mountain busting. And uh, while I'm here, 2 kilotons of TNT is small town level, not island level. <laughs> what are these stats for? <laughs> but either way, this is a great fight with some okay analyses, but not a lot to talk about. 77 out of 100. Another overlooked sprite fight from season 3, but I kinda get why it's overshadowed. Man, that outbreak nearly suffocated me. Yeah, well, I probably could've survived that. Anyways, we interrupt this unnecessarily long video to say there's gonna be a more... Serious discussion of a certain word used in the episode, one that may or may not have been a slur back in 2016. Although I think you forgot to include a disclaimer for that one word used in season one. But who cares? Yeah. Weird how the next time doesn't have Deadpool himself speaking, but okay. 
Out of all the episodes that had to be rushed due to scheduling conflicts, Deadpool vs. Pinkie Pie has one of the craziest cases since Kirby vs. Majin Buu. And that's because this was not supposed to be the Season 3 finale. Originally, it was going to be Power Rangers vs. Voltron, but that had to be delayed because of how expensive the episode was to make. So they scheduled Lara Croft vs. Nathan Drake to be the finale, and then have Megazord vs. Voltron be the Season 4 premiere. But production wasn't looking too kindly for that placement either. So with all of that being pushed back, Deadpool vs. Pinkie Pie was slotted as the supposed Season 3 finale, even though it was supposed to happen at some point in Season 4. And let's get some of the issues out of the way right now. Deadpool's analysis wasn't as fun as his last one. Instead of bantering with Wiz and Boomstick and making some funny visual gags, he mostly just gives exposition. And that's nowhere near as funny as Deadpool actively interacting with the host. Also, the eraser gag would have been funny if it didn't drag on for too long or halt in progression. Why? Also, I think you forgot to add a reference to the Spider-Man franchise you're referring to, Wadey. First ah! of all, I'm obviously referring to the film series as... <laughs> Nobody reads comics anymore. Manga for life, am I right? And second of all, don't call me weighty. Uncle JJ. Let's talk about Pinkie Pie's analysis, and yep, the elephant's got another plot in this hole. Except this time it's not a plot hole, it's, uh... Pinkie's spastic demeanor? That. Okay, I did some digging, and technically in America, it's not considered a slur. It's considered to be derogatory, and still a rude word nonetheless, but if you live in areas like the UK, Australia, etc., it's considered very offensive there. As spastic was a term that was used to insult people who had cerebral palsy. It's also been used as a word to insult neurodivergent people, but at the same time, I don't think it's comparable to the time where they called Mikey a slur because there, it was directly used as a means of insulting him, whereas here, they're saying, yeah, she's a little quirky, but look at all the other cool stuff she can do. And on top of that, it'd be a very easy fix. Just change the word. Whereas with Mikey, you'd have to change literally everything about his analysis to fix the problem. It doesn't matter if you magically stop calling him a slur, you're still mindlessly insulting a fictional character for pretty much no reason at all. I mean, I'm still docking points for this, cause even though it's not a slur in America, it's still very derogatory, and I was surprised as to how offensive it actually is. Though I do think it could have been a lot worse. And there is exactly one more moment where they directly bring up neurodivergence and autism again, and ho oh, ho ho, I can't wait to talk about that. But aside from that, Pinkie Pie's analysis was alright. Her fourth wall breaking in the analysis is handled way better than with Deadpool, where her sprites replace her character model on screen. And the voice actor she has in the episode is also dubbing over the lines from the cartoon as well. And the background music also helps make this analysis more enjoyable. With some Legend of Zelda music here and there, and then some bright and poppy music, it's pretty nice. I mean, yeah, Pinky also gives some exposition, but it's in the context of Wiz and Boomstick letting her do it, as opposed to Deadpool, who does nothing but act like one of the hosts. But then we get to, uh, the fight. The start of the fight has some fun fourth wall breaking with a lightsaber-like bar, the pop-up ad, the rating forcing Deadpool to censor himself, and then they start invading other episodes. When they invade Batman vs. Cap's joke, it's not as funny as I remember, but the dance-off they have in Ken vs. Terry, that's still cute. But when they invade Amy vs. Ramona, it's a complete waste. Just complaining about the arcade machine being broken? Really? Also, you're telling me that Pinkie Pie sees Rainbow Dash and doesn't just instantly dive into the episode by herself with Deadpool reluctantly chasing her? I get that that episode was season one and it would probably be difficult to reuse the same assets of that episode. Actually, that point doesn't hold any water because Batman vs. Cap was animated by Zach Watkins. Eh, whatever. They dive into the Death Battle cast and it's pretty great. You have Deadpool calling Ben an idiot, which is apparently a reference to Takahata's glorious rant on how Ben is wrong about everything. Chad losing his smile the moment Deadpool insults his hair. That's a mood. And Nick's response to Deadpool being a pretty hilarious comeback delivered with some fresh copium. Love it. I would like to point out that these fourth wall breaking ideas were actually pitched during Deadpool vs. Deathstroke, but they were scrapped because they wanted the episode to have a more serious tone. I do think it helps distinguish the two episodes. Do you want an episode that focuses on Deadpool's fourth wall breaking? Go to Deadpool vs. Pinkie Pie. Or do you want a Deadpool episode that's far more serious? Go to Deadpool vs. Deathstroke- Wait, what the f What Deadpool? How did you get into my video like that? Because I see all and I see that you're such a hacky editor. Okay. Then Deadpool says it's his birthday, Pinkie Pie throws him a party, and, um, it ends. Okay, I don't mind the cop-out ending as much as other people do, but, eh, 
the episode is just slapped in the middle of this long road with a clean 50 out of 100. I have no strong opinions on this episode one way or the other. Though a rematch or a reimagining of a fourth wall break episode would be pretty cool. Pretty fitting that the season ends off on an episode I feel completely neutral on. For such an infamous season, it's no surprise that my opinions are about as volatile as season 2. I didn't hate everything about each episode, and I found more to like about them than I thought I would. Some would say that most of season 1's entire repertoire is worse than season 3's lineup. I agree that season 3 is better on a technical level, but since I grew up with season 1, I still like it more for its charm, its memes, and its Goku vs Superman. And with that in mind, I can see why some consider season 3 to be the worst season of Death Battle. When pitting it against the rest of the series up to this point, things become more standardized, but we barely see any changes in quality. Its flaws are very apparent and some people are still not over them, and I even share some of those qualms as well. One of those flaws that I don't see get talked about too much is the drop in quality of the characters as analysis portions. There are some exceptions here and there, but the vast majority of them are kinda boring, and that's really sad when you consider how engaging they were in Season 2. However, in terms of the fight animations themselves, I think it has some sleeper hits that people should wake up on. Ratchet and Clank vs Jack and Daxter has been getting a lot more love lately, and that's great, so I hope to see episodes like Ken vs Terry, Joker vs Sweet Tooth, Meta vs Carolina, and Zoro vs Erza getting some respect on their names as well. Plus, what's important to acknowledge is that while Torian was busting out some certified bangers and Tracer vs Scout, the sprite team wasn't doing so hot. Remember that Zack wasn't able to work on any of these sprite episodes, and a lot of their other heavy hitters went to move on to One Minute Melee before they went MIA. I still miss you! And the new hires had to adjust to a stricter schedule that Death Battle has never seen before. And while some people weren't vibing with the workload and had to leave Death Battle behind them, others would go find astronomical improvements by the following season, or at least sometime after that. This was just the first step in the awkward growth necessary for the show. It had multiple embarrassing moments, but just because we all like to hold on to them doesn't mean it has to be for the negative reasons. Season 4 was when they got used to this new schedule and put out 16 episodes instead of 14, so this could mean that the Sears would finally find us one way. However, I don't know if I can fully justify saying that. And those that aren't subscribed to my channel don't deserve to know the reason why UNTIL THEY SUBSCRIBE- <laughs>